the title of my presentation is the hormones from hormones to harnessing the biotech revolution. How do we make the most projectile biopsies? So why do we care about projectile biopsies? Well, it turns out that these samples are the most important um, way to acquire biological material from cetaceans. These are the, the, the way we acquire the, the most samples, biological samples from free range cetaceans. And so um, <clears throat> we've been doing this um, for about 20 years now. And in that time, places like the Southwest Fisheries Science Center have also amassed quite large collections. So we have on the order of tens of thousands of biopsies um, covering maybe 50% of, uh, or at least getting close to 50% of cetacean species. So large collections, um, these are easily targeted samples that we can acquire relatively quickly on the, on the scale of dozens, and in some cases, uh, up to 100 samples in a particular day. So this is <clears throat> in a field that's dominated with the rate that many step is acquisition of, of samples, especially when you're studying the biology of these animals. This is one of the, the most um, efficient ways to get biological material. Um, though I am really excited about the, uh, the new stuff they're doing with uh, capturing belows. That's a, a very neat thing. So, um, so even though we've collected tens of thousands of of biopsies, it's still very difficult to get each one. It is, like I said, the rate limiting step for almost any biological study that we do with cetaceans, free-ranging cetaceans. And so they're very valuable samples, and of course they impact the animals. So the more that we can do with a single sample, the more we make of these, these difficult to obtain samples, and we're minimizing the impact on the animals. And this is a um, figure I put together when, um, at the turn of the millennium when I just started grad school. Um, and this was all the, the data that I kind of envisioned that we would get and we're getting at this time from a single, that we could conceivably obtain from a single biopsy or, or that was being obtained from biopsy. And um, each one of those kind of outer circles is the, uh, the genre of markers and then the information is on the, the final spokes there. And the <laughs> intention here is to show we're still getting kind of the same type of data, but what we've moved forward in because we used to get predominantly just DNA from a single sample, but we're doing a better job, and I think this will continue to get better, is that we're now getting DNA contaminants, hormones out of a single biopsy. And I do think within the next decade or two, we will be able to, as we micronize the procedures, and need less material, we'll be able to get all of this information from a single biopsy, and then give a lot of, basically, biology for a single individual. And I think that'll help our studies quite a bit. Um, my little focus has been this corner um, right down here, looking at the, the hormones, and, uh, and that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about first. I'll just give you an example of what I'm doing, and then I'm going to tell you where I think the field is going to go. So we acquired most of the, well, all the hormone signals from the blubber that's attached to these biopsies. And so far we've looked at pretty much four genre of um, four types of hormones, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, and thyroid hormones. And they're in different stages of development. Um, progesterone and testosterone fully developed, fully validated. Uh, progesterone being the absolute most important of the markers that we uh, assay for. Because it, it tells us about <laughs> reproductive, uh, female reproduction. And this is important as we as we struggle, yesterday we were talking about human threats, as we struggle to identify the threats and how they might affect biology or the population biology of the animals, this is one way that we can start to look at a marker of population health, and that's the, the, the uh, population's ability to reproduce. So we can uh, obtain indices of uh, reproductive success in for a population using the pregnancy rate. We also look at testosterone to, to tell us something about the um, age distribution within a group by looking at sexual maturation and we can, we can determine breeding season. Um, cortisol is a method that we have totally worked out as far as is quantifying the levels, but we still haven't validated it. <coughs> Unlike progesterone and testosterone, where you know for a validation animal, an animal that you know is pregnant or not, or sexually mature or not, it's very difficult to get animals that you know are stressed or not, or any gradation of stress. But it's been very difficult to 
to uh, finally validate the cortisol assay, but it's important. Um, the Navy is particularly interested in, in doing this work. They want to, they're interested in how sonar activity might affect cortisol mm -hmm. levels, might cause a stress response. And this is the way actually with, with Dorian's help, uh, we're gonna try to be able to validate some of the cortisol levels. And finally, just recently we started a, a project to start quantifying thyroid hormones. Um, and this, these are indicative of nutritional stress, um, also lipophilic, so likely to be found in the blubber. Uh, and we are working uh, with a number of groups, and, and including a hopefully work, in order to look to see how different uh, prey conditions, but also contaminant loads, might affect our concentrations. So, <coughs> so now I'm going to take you through kind of the most important one, again, and that's the progesterone. And this is. Um, these are progesterone values from the blubber of common dolphins or B common dolphins. And what we find is that pregnant common dolphins have a whole lot of progesterone on the order of 60 to 100 times more progesterone than their non-pregnant counterparts. Um, and more importantly, we see, at least empirically, almost no overlap between pregnant and non-pregnant. In this, in this case, there is no overlap. There's a fourfold difference between the highest levels we see in non-pregnant animals and the lowest levels we see in pregnant ones. That leads to a very easy um, marker that clearly distinguishes pregnancy groups. Uh, and then I also want to say that uh, Marissa Petrago has a poster out, and she shows that this, this signal is very similar across a whole range of different species. And so that, that gives us hope that even species we won't be able to validate on will still be uh, show similar types of traits where we'll be able to distinguish pregnancy. And it is really very simple. I like this, uh, this is data that just came uh, from Marissa uh, to me just a week ago. And uh, this was 25 animals, uh, following those dolphins that were part of a live capture event in Georgia. Um, the group there wanted me to quantify uh, progesterone levels. They knew the pregnancy state from, um, basically from um, ultrasound. And it was, really straightforward. I mean, without even looking, only having the information that we have right here, it was very easy to see who was pregnant. I just wanted to kind of highlight how a no-brainer this is. Because there's such <laughs> large differences between those who are pregnant and those that are not. Okay, so how do we use this? I thought about this a lot yesterday. In this case, <clears throat> what we're looking at is how particular stressors, how they might affect reproduction. We have the stressor here is fishing effort, and we're looking at how that might affect spotted dolphin pregnancy rates. So just, just a quick background, background on the tuna dolphin issue. From the 1950s to 1990s, first saving for yellowfin tuna led to exceedingly high dolphin mortality. Um, northeastern spotted dolphins were taken down to about 10% of their pre-exploitation uh, level, so that's 90% that they totally lost. Um, Fish industry changed their saving methods in the early 1990s to release the dolphins before they brought up the tuna, and of course, observed mortality drops precipitously. I mean, magnitudes. But um, for some reason, dolphin populations haven't shown any robust signs of rebounding. One thought is that if you take a particular dolphin, on average, an individual dolphin is chased eight times, chased in the circle eight times per year. There are places where that, that number can be as much as 50 times per year. You can imagine how this continue, continuous perturbation might affect and inhibit reproduction and cause, may cause stress response, or just may break up mating enough that you get a depressed reproduction. So we started to look at that. We had 200 and, um, 208 biopsies collected from the region, measured progesterone levels, and found that 11.5% of the, of the group was pregnant. More importantly, we found areas where we found really high pregnancy levels and those areas with very low pregnancy levels. And so you can see actually in this, this northern area, we have um, it's quite high. 25%, and this is all females, 25% of all females are pregnant. Very low down here, this is just the 3.4% and then 10% in the very southern region. So 
we started looking at uh, fishing effort. This is the distribution of fishing effort. This is a, um, based on an algorithm that a, a colleague of mine wrote. And what it does is basically it adds up the number of dolphin sets that took place in the time right before a biopsy was, was collected. So we're looking at 70 days before a biopsy was collected, 140, 180 days before a sample was collected. And they can add up the number of uh, dolphin beds that took place in the area. And they're weighted by basically how close in time and space that, that they occur. And when we ask the question, um, are pregnant animals, are they, are they exposed to the fishery different? What we found is, indeed they were, and it was quite dramatic, the difference. Here are the three windows I was talking about, 70, 140, and 180 day windows. In each of the cases, the pregnant animals had much lower ex ex uh, fishery exposure indices than the non-pregnant ones. So this is kind of it's a little easier way of asking, a statistically easier way of asking the same question are in areas of high fishing, that do we see a lower pregnancy rate? So this was basically the same result you would expect if there was having a detrimental effect, and it's, it's quite dramatic. So that, again, as far as how this relates to this region, the idea is there's a stressor, we can quantify it, um, in this case fishing effort, and then we can see a, a potential effect to the population, and this is reproduction. So the same could be too done with um, sonar exposure, contaminant loading, um, uh, harmful algal blooms, any of those are potential stressors that we have the ability to measure, and then we can measure a population effect at the same time. So this is a good way at least to, to start at seeing um, how some of these stressors might affect uh, <coughs> population. So, uh, a couple more so let me just, uh, <coughs> this is a radical change from what I was just talking about because this, I think in, in a few years, in, in, well, at least in a few decades, will make what I'm doing fairly obsolete. So you can see what I was, marker by marker, one at a time, I would develop, validate, and such. With the advent of the sequencing technology that uh, Phil was talking about in his presentation, it really opens up quite a bit of new possibilities, new markers. And instead of looking at one at a time, even tens at a time, we have the ability to look at thousands, tens of thousands, even a hundred thousand different markers in a particular run for a particular animal for a particular piece of skin. And so this not only gives you a lot of different potential data points to, to look at, but you can get signatures so if it is something complex of, of stress. And in this way, especially if we're looking at the transcriptomics, the, the RNA, the protein, and the metabolites, you get a full picture of what's going on in the physiology of the cell. And so this just kind of tells you what happened at different time frames. So RNA just right before the sampling, proteins a little bit before that, and of course the metabolites a little bit before that. So you get a window of what's going on in the, in the, in the cells at a particular time, and there are likely signatures on a particular uh, event. And so again, we'd be looking at reproduction, we could look at exposure of different events, but it is heavily dependent on um, validating the samples. You have to have animals of known condition in different, so pregnant or not, exposed to folic acid or not, in order to uh, able to use this approach. And uh, I did want to say that well, they're well behind the medical uh, health field. Omics is coming to remember with research, and it's coming on kind of recently, but quite a bit has, has taken place in the last four years. The first dolphin microarray was published in 07. Um, it had on the order of 1,000 genes on it. Um, in 08, we got our first genome, bottlenose genomes sequenced. It was a rough sequencing, but it was fully annotated. It was 2x coverage. Um, 09, we had our first skin cDNA to library. And again, this is really important. Unlike the leukocyte database or um, microarray that happened in 07, again, skin is our most likely sample that we're going to obtain. So it was important that they got a, a skin cDNA library, and soon they'll be constructing, or probably have already constructed a microarray from that cDNA library. In 2010, a group of undergraduates at uh, San Diego State University started sequencing and had finished sequencing the sea lion genome. It's being annotated presently, and we'll have that. And then uh, there was an updated array 
another magnitude more of genes, and that will continue to take place. We'll get more and more genes in these uh, microarrays. And then finally, last year, which I think is actually most excited about, is the establishment of the marine mammal omics, I said working group, but it's really a consortium that was put together, and it was a group of people with very different skill sets and interests, and it takes that much in order to get omics projects going. But all together, different resources, different uh, capital equipment, together kind of pushing forward to the same goal, and uh, I think that this will keep us on this, the same track. And I think what I'll do, I do have, this is the last slide here, showing some of the obstacles, uh, sample quality, validation, large capital investments, and sharing of information. And what I'll do is that it, um, during the discussion period, um, maybe we can, we can talk about some of these, these future obstacles. Okay, thank you very much.